And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother into the temple. Coming to us straight from Diverse Publishing, previously the madmen behind the game of Dylance known as Nexus, now coming back on GameFound with Legacy Edition, which managed to get um, fully, fully backed in, uh, in less than an hour, in fact, 34 minutes if I'm reading this right. The one and only J. Scott Rumps. How you doing today, man? I'm doing wonderfully today. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you. Thank you for... Inv thank you for um, being willing to come back all the way to my temple. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Mm -hmm. I love the walk. It's a beautiful walk up to the temple. And you can't beat the view. Mm -hmm. So, I do want to. I do want to offer my congrats for for get it for being able to get the original board game out, um, out in physical form. Thank you. Um, it, it was it was a rocky road, but we finally pulled it off. It was a ro it was a rocky road, but um, a win's a win. And the things the thing is significantly bigger than than I anticipated it was going to be. It's <laughs> it is the largest it is the second largest box out of um any out of anything in my library. The only the only thing that kind of rivals it is the World of Warcraft board game and that's uh, that's got slightly different dimensions so that's kind of cheating yeah well it does and I made sure of this it was very important to me it does fit on a calyx so mm -hmm. while we had a big box I wanted to uh, I wanted to make sure people could actually store it uh, without having to build special shelving yeah I've um I've yelled. I've yelled re regarding certain books and certain board games that have to have weird ass dimensions, where, um, j where just, just putting the stuff on the shelves feels like feels like I'm solving a Rubik's cube. <coughs> yeah. Or the world's worst version of Tetris, also known as <laughs> Yet Three. <laughs> Interesting story. It's actually how we ended up with the magnetic frames for the uh, area command panel. Mm -hmm. is to make sure that we didn't have to make a giant 17 inch box to to box the game which is certainly appreciated um, I'm pretty it's it certainly is it certainly is heavier and well well carrying it carrying it from the from the pickup area to to the to the third floor where I am um in my in my place was a bit was a bit of a I won't say a bit. I won't say a full-on workout, but oh, de definitely what definitely was a. Th you got your cardio in, your steps, your weights. It was a full workout. Is. Unfortunately, I ha unfortunately I am not a short man, so I'm not gonna be I'm not gonna be doing a whole lot of the squeezing into tight spaces thing. <laughs> no, instead, I'm, instead I'm just gonna end up bumping my head off of exit signs. But now that now that that's coming in, you're co you're coming in with Legacy Edition and. I think the first thing to ask is, was Legacy Edition something that you were prototyping while the while the full game was being developed, or was it a case where the ideas started to come in after the original game was finished? It's actually um, the original idea of the game. So, if you go all the way back in a time machine to our first Kickstarter, um, I think it was 2018. We we had everything just all in one massive uh, campaign, mm -hmm. and legacy was part of 
the initial offering and it was actually the main offering at the time and <clears throat> as as people have played this version of nexus and as we've demoed it over the years and and we've failed kickstarters and and tried to figure out where things were going awry and 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 really focusing on what we were trying to accomplish we realized it would probably be better to do this boxed version of the game and make it more of a one-off to get people familiar with the basic core of the system. Uh, I've got a friend that that calls Nexus a kind of sandbox arena combat system, and it really was that that is what it is. It it has its ground mechanisms for for combat and how things interact, and then you can just build all types of stuff on top of it. Mm -hmm. um, originally, we wanted people to just do that right out of the box, right? And you open it up and just kind of go wild with this, you know, new combat system and all these minis and all this stuff. And what we found is a lot of people, it, it was it was almost too much too fast. So we started play testing the big box arena combat system, the, the thing that we released last time where, where it was just a one-off. Um, we got rid of all the legacy elements and, and kind of the um, leveling up and, and all that type of stuff and just kept it more more like a board game. And we found that played really well. We found that people had an easier time wrapping their head around what they were buying and what we were trying to do. Mm -hmm. So rewind back to this year as we started fulfilling the big box game um, and people started playing it and jumping into our Discord and, and jumping into the comment section and saying, man, it would be really cool to, you know, do this and do that. And, you know, my comments were always like, yeah, yeah, that's going to be really neat. That's kind of, that's coming. <laughs> you know, people started, people started realizing what they had bought and, and what they had. And this is just kind of us uh, coming out and saying, hey, so here's the rest of all the, all the fun that, is actually in that box. Um, you know, if you look at your copy, you'll notice when you even when you set it up for four players, you have a bunch of coins left in that box because I designed it knowing that this legacy book was going to be coming out and people were going to need extra coins and they were going to need extra components and things like that for the legacy edition. And I don't want to have them have them go out and rebuy things or package it up, you know, with stuff like that. I wanted people to be able to just get the book and have everything they needed. Uh, future proofing. Yeah, my best attempt at future proofing. You never know what kind of crazy ideas will will come up before uh, before this thing actually hits the press. Yeah. So, and th in this case, the press being me, unfortunately. <laughs> so. With that in mind, with that in mind, I think we can, I think this is as good a time as any to go kind of point by point with some aspects. I do remember really, really early on, uh, one of the things you wanted to do with the Dverse was an RPG, and would it be fair of me to say that some of the DNA from that early project made its way in, made its way into Legacy Edition? Some of it, it, it actually had a it actually had a stronger influence when we sat down to make it a more of a one off board game, and and part of that were the trait dice that we had come up for the for the RPG system. Uh, that's where the trait dice originated. Uh, that's the core component of our RPG system are those trait dice, and that that started working its way into into the board game. Um, and then a lot of the RPG stuff was actually inspired by the board game, such as like the cybernetics and the biomutations and, and different things like that. And then that's come and, and found its way back into back into the Nexus with the Legacy Edition. Because mm -hmm. obviously the first thing that we'd have that we'd have to cover is creating your own Lanista, and. Mm -hmm. This is part of the reason why I asked if some of the RPG aspects had had come in because um, obviously you had the you, you had the character creation set up in the material from from that and with this one 
While it isn't exactly the same thing, there's some o there's going to be some overlap. Yeah, yeah, there's a little bit. So, so with the Lanista, it's a it's very simple. The, the Lanista is in a very complicated character because you don't have to have a whole lot of different options because every Lanista, you know, is essentially the same thing. It's it's some alien trying to increase its own fame and fortune through the brutal existence of these helots. Um, now, what, what you do have is you, you have the three main stats, which we introduce those in the, in the board game, which is influence, deception, and command. And that controls basically your influence uh, over barge captains and such throughout the course of the fight. It kind of represents all the bribes and underhand dirty things that you've done before the, before the bout even begins. And uh, deception and command are are used directly, you know, in the game during during combat. Now, what we introduce now are Lannister skills, which those aren't in that box game. And these Lannister skills can be anything from uh, getting discounts on equipment, uh, opening up things that you technically shouldn't have access to yet. Uh, because everything's hidden behind a um, a prominence wall, so prominence is a is a Lannister's level, and cred would be a Lannister's like their experience points. So the more cred you get, the higher your prominence becomes. The higher your prominence becomes, the more uh, skills you're able to take, and the more you're able to increase your stats. And the better your the better your chances are of having higher quality helots, better gear and such during the fights. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm guessing that Linus, is it a case where Lin, where Linista created um, games would have would have to be some sort of side mode from ones that are using presets, or are they cross compatible? So they're they're cross compatible. Right, um, it's it's no different than having like a pre-generated D and D character, right? So let's say you and your buddies are are playing Nexus, and you guys play regularly, and you've been leveling up your you know Linistas, and uh, you've got a, a friend who's not familiar with the game yet, and you're teaching them. You want to play with them one night, and everybody wants to use their characters that they've been building up. Um, he can just grab one of those cards out of the box, and you know essentially he's got a a Lanista preset with a prominence level of three. Um, or you could quick roll, you know, a character like you do in D&D, &D, right? <clears throat> Bring somebody in at the third level, um, have them pick all their skills and, and figure out what they want, and then kind of roll from there. Mm. I'm, I'm not going to presume to tell people how to enjoy the, the game. Um, <laughs> I'm just giving them the, the tools to kind of do what they, what they want when it hits their table. I'm giving them a lot of options. Yeah. Yeah, and for for me, one of the things that would be a bit of a concern when you're when you're introducing um, character when you're introducing full full spectrum creation is making sure that you don't have a creep issue of of later stuff being more useful than former stuff. Mm hmm. So you're going to find when you play Nexus, and um, it's everything's instantaneous strategy or, or situational strategy. It's too random. There's too many things that are going to happen um, for you to have a really clear advantage. You're, you're going to have mathematical advantages, but it's not always going to come up, right? Um, one of the parodies I look at is, you know, you have for example, like the New England Patriots during their heyday, to use a, a sports analogy, where they're just expected to come and, and crush the Tennessee Titans. Um, but, you know, that's a funny-shaped ball, and all types of crazy stuff happens when you're out there on that football field, and you just never know how things are going to turn out. It's it's why they play the game. And, and Nexus is very much like that, um, more so. There's a little bit more chaos in the uh, in the barge bouts. Yeah. So, with 
So with that in with that in mind, there's also the whole the whole thing of leveling up Lenista. Not leveling up Lenista's leveling up um hel helots. Mm -hmm. So that's going for that's going further into it, and I th this is where I, this is where I was really reminded of some of the um some of the stuff from I think it was Redemption at the time at the time. Yep, Nexus Redemption, still the title, working mm -hmm. title. Yep, still the title. I still have that preview from quite a while ago. Yeah, I believe 2019 is when we did that. Mm -hmm. So with that, with now given the le given the leveling up, um, once again, I'm, once again, I'm guessing that an effort has been made to make sure that it that it isn't um, introducing a creep factor to the already existing helots. Right. So when when you get when you get your helots, your helot motivations, um, you're going to have different levels again based on your Lannister's prominence, mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be the the original eight motivations. Uh, then there's going to be six advanced motivations, and then you're going to have the ability to actually work with the gnomes and, and create your your helots from from scratch, and those are going to be the bioengineered helots. Mm -hmm. So, with with all of these, um, with all of these options available to you as a Lannister, you can only have a troop of three helots at any given time, um, at least in this edition. So, these these three helots are going to increase in fame, and as they increase in fame, it's going to make your job a little bit easier to increase your cred. In, in prominence, but they're also going to die, and they're going to have limbs removed in the fights, and you're going to have to spend bits to repair those helots. Uh, you're going to have to have surgeries on those helots when they lose limbs to reattach either cybernetic limbs or try and grow new limbs, and you're going to have a lot of options when it when it comes to that, but you're not going to have an unlimited income when it comes to making those decisions. So you actually may be selling some of your, sending some of your helots into bouts, missing an arm or a leg. Uh, you may just slaughter the helots so you can sell the biomatter back to the gnomes. It, it's going to be a lot of decisions like that that you're, that you're going to make as, as a Lannista. When you have a helot that is a premier specimen, right? Like this thing's been lucky enough to survive a long time. It's got a lot of fame. You've had successful cybernetic operations on it and it's it's rather powerful. Well, you're not going to put that helot in a fight against somebody's helot just brand new with nothing to lose. <laughs> because they're going to do everything in their power if if nothing else, make sure that your helot doesn't recover from the battle. So it, it's kind of like boxing, um, a, you know, where you're not going to have the heavyweight champ fight some kid with absolutely nothing to lose just starting out in boxing. It, it would be a ridiculous decision to make. And if you do, there's a good chance that you're going to have to pay the price for, um, for that decision. So that in and of itself kind of balances things out in the nexus, depending on the group of people that you're that you're playing with though so, you know what's fun you know what's funny about that if, if we're going to be using sports analogies <laughs> is um you're familiar with you're familiar with tune-up mat you're familiar with tune-up games in college like college football okay where you'll yeah. you'll have a t you'll have a top tier team like say like say um like say lsu or yeah like michigan or, and appalachian or, state yeah just and ju <laughs> just 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 have them have them go up against a team that has no business, um, has no business against pl against playing real teams just to get the players' confidence up. Yeah, because and uh, most of the time, the job of a Appalachian State in this kind of situation or a SMU is to get their ass kicked. Yeah. Then again, there are those times where that doesn't happen, and <laughs> and yeah. um, you have embarrassing reverses, and of course, in pro wrestling, you have jobbers. <laughs> right, right. 
Oh. But yeah, you have a you know you have a situation like in Appalachian State and in Michigan, and every so often Appalachian State wins, and Michigan season's over after game one, <laughs> which was supposed to be their tune-up game. But yeah, there's so balance. It, balance is important, but not not really to to me. Um, you you don't want to have you don't want to have it not fun to play. But you also don't want it to be not fun to create because you're so worried about balance. That's I just think a, I think point. a lot of people misinterpret balance as being the same. Um, right. Because I've and I have I have seen that argument or the argument of um, of balance being unnecessary for for games. Um, I remember when jo- when John Wick, no, not that one. <laughs> uh, made that made that cl- made that claim in a blog post he called "Chess is not a role playing game," and I remember replying, "Aren't you the same guy who made those who made those really really broken spell lists for L for L five R back in the day that you got roasted over?" <laughs> no, it's it's a case it's a case of glass houses. Yeah, but you you don't want to make it unfun, and yeah. and that you know that's to me. That's my metric. If things start to become unfun, then it's broken and it needs to be addressed. Would you say the line is when there's a certain approach or a certain strategy that just ends up being way too useful to the point where um, it, there's no good there's no good reason to not do it? Absolutely. Yeah. When when you notice everybody's just doing the same thing and no one's experimenting and it's no this is you know, this is mathematically the best way to do it, and you know, I blah blah blah, and that that becomes the predominant thing. Then, yeah, it's it's time to rethink what what you've done and make some changes or introduce some counters to to that. Mm-hmm. Um, a good example of that is in the box game right now. People uh, people seem to really enjoy playing the supremacist. Uh, the supremacist can grapple. Um, at a discount, and grappling has some pretty um, nasty, uh, nasty effects to your opponent. Mm-hmm. Now, what you're essentially doing, though, when you fight with that philosophy, is is you're having to do two successful attacks to land a, a blow when you're doing grapple. Um, but people's perception of it has caused it to become very popular and that's probably the one thing that I'll get emails and comments about more than anything is hey do you think maybe the supremacist needs to be nerfed a little bit to which I say yes if you find that going on in in your group then absolutely you need to do that Um, and from a design uh, standpoint I kept that in mind as I was going through the the legacy edition and put some really great counters to um, that special talent in here mm. for people who need that in their group. And if I were to use a video game example of crossing that line, um, I'd, prob- I'd probably have to bring up, say, Odd Job back, w- back when myself and my buddies all played Goldeneye. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. To the point where I instituted a rule that if you pick, go- if you pick Odd Job, after the match, we all we all get we all get to do to give you one punch below the belt. <laughs> right. Now some people some people still a couple times people picked it thinking that, thinking I was kidding, and then afterwards <laughs> I, I was like, "All right, stand up, everybody, everybody, get in the line." Yeah. Oh. And some people were smarter th- and thought, "Oh, I'll, I'll just wear I'll just wear a cup." Um. If you hit hard, if you hit hard enough, a cup doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, let, you know, like how Cyclops's eye beams are technically concussive, but so is a cannonball. <laughs> but speaking of that, you're adding ten new motiv- ten new motivations, and I'm, right. I'm guessing you, I'm guessing you guys went out of your way to make sure that. None of the new motivations are stepping on the toes of what's already there. So these are actually, again, um, these are actually all the original motivations from the very first version of the game. Uh, 
part of the thing that we did when we scaled everything down for the uh, box release was um, pick four motivations um, that we thought would be the best to include in the initial base set of Nexus. But these um, total of 14 motivations were all created together at the beginning. Uh, matter of fact, a lot of people who came out and uh, would uh, be involved in playtesting or play at conventions like Gen Con and Origins and things like that, they played a lot of the characters that, that aren't even uh, released yet officially. Um, well, I, I, I shouldn't say that. They're they're not in the in the in the plastic big box version. They've all always been available in resin, and that's a that's a big aspect of our community are people who buy the resin models and assemble them, paint them, and use them. Um, but these were all created together, and it's probably one of the reasons the supremacist seems overpowered in in the in the box is because the anti supremacist <laughs> motivations. Um, are are sitting on the sidelines waiting for the for the big box expansion to come out. Mm-hmm. So the way you're now the way you're describing it so far, Legacy Edition is giving me the vibe of a director's cut of Nexus. Would that be <laughs> off base? Not not completely off base. No, I mean it's it it it's the type of thing where if you're enjoying Nexus and you want you want more mm-hmm. you want to get a little bit deeper into it um that that's what that's what this legacy edition is so are are you familiar with blood bowl at all yes okay. um i remember i remember hope i remember hoping that whoever designed all of the mtx bullshit for blood bowl 3 gets salt poured into their eyes <laughs> so Think of it. Think of Nexus, th- this Legacy Edition, as as kind of bringing a Blood Bowl aspect to it, right? Like you you have your whole team of guys, and they can get increased skills as they're playing, and they can get a little bit of EXP, so you can um, make them move an extra square, or you can um, increase their tackle zone, or give them dodge, or you know, you've got this laundry list of things, and. Um, some are excluded from some of the players and some aren't excluded from some of the players and as a coach you're you're building your team and guys are dying and you're having to replace them or they're getting injured and you got to decide if you want to replace them or not or maybe you don't have enough money to replace them and, and all of that kind of comes into play so this legacy edition is bringing that type of aspect into that big box game where you're going everything's going to persist and at the end of the fight going oh man my guy lost both of his arms that was great you know that was hilarious and then the next time you play you just pick a different character this time you're left with a helot with no arms and if you lost the fight you you didn't get as many bits as the other guy so now you got to decide am i going to spend the money to try and replace this thing's arms or am i going to send it off to slaughter am i going to put it into a fight maybe just replacing one arm am i going to use this as an opportunity to start attaching cybernetics because the gnomes won't let you attach cybernetics to a helot unless they've actually lost an arm in combat Mm -hmm. because they feel like their data is no good after that happens so they don't care what you do to the helot after that point um it brings in. It just brings you a little bit deeper into uh, the theme of the game, and kind of adds that that extra role play aspect to the game. Yeah, and then we then of course there's the fact that we have some we have some new hazard systems, some new um new ways to reset the days without a workplace accident. <laughs> so I, like I so I'm probably going to steal that from you. That's an, that's another line that I think I'm going to have to steal from you. <laughs> yeah, I, you keep you keep doing this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start asking for compensation. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free, ask yeah. all you want. But because <laughs> we have we have we have dark columns, we have toxic waste barrels, the creature pit, and the barge beast. I'm yes. guessing dark columns would be a case of um, death by death by falling by um, falling down a flight of darts. 
<laughs> so so the dark columns are actually random random effects. They don't always do the same thing. Um, so you'll you'll roll on a on a table to see what the effects of a dark column is going to have on your helmet if they get struck by the by the darts. Mm -hmm. um, some of them will just knock them prone. Some of them will make them start hallucinating. Some of them will paralyze them. Um, some of them will actually help. Uh, there's always a chance that your helmet dodges the dart. Um, and then there's actually a whole different effects table for the dart columns and their effect on the barge beast if the barge beast happens to be in the same arena bout with dart columns. And the dart columns tend to help the barge beast more than more than hinder it. Uh, all right. And obviously toxic, toxic waste barrels are exactly what it says on the tin, though... Would somebody be able to say, would say, knock it over to to make some hazardous round? Yes. So you're going to knock over the toxic waste barrels to cause toxic spills, mm -hmm. and these are going to be a new tile. So right now in the um, in the Nexus, you have blood tiles and guts tiles. Toxic waste barrels are going to introduce uh, toxic waste tiles, and your uh, toxic waste tiles are going to have a couple different effects on the on the match. Number one, they're highly ignitable and explodable. So if a toxic waste tile or even a toxic waste barrel for that matter should happen to make contact with fire, um, big booms, big booms all around. Uh, but if not, if, if you want to send your helmet over into that toxic waste to splash around a little bit, um, there is a mutations deck uh, similar to the to the weapon card deck that will assign a random mutation just for that just for that particular bout to that helmet. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I'm I'm pretty sure somebody's gonna I'm pretty sure somebody's gonna use it to set to set fire traps. That's inevitable. <laughs> Absolutely. See, one of the things that's really neat about the toxic waste and how it plays, especially with the fire, is you you're going to have players that are going to want to send their their helots towards those toxic waste spills, but you're also going to have players that are going to want to knock braziers down near that area. So you're you're constantly going to have this draw to something that's extremely and potentially very dangerous and, and hazardous for your uh, for your opponent. Mm -hmm. And of course, things like the creature pit and the barge beast. I'm put I'm putting in one continuous things, so I'm guessing those would be um, mo monsters that are neutral and, ju and just are going to wreck everybody's shit no matter whose side it is out there? Absolutely. Matter of fact, um, one of the things that hasn't made its way to the campaign page yet, uh, but it has been changed in the, in the working version of the Legacy book, is we call the Barge Beast and the Creature Pit now uh, hostile entities. Mm -hmm. So they're they're not necessarily just hazards, just lumped in with all the hazards because they are different. Yeah. Um, they have their own AI decks that that they use throughout the course of the fight. But yeah, these hostile entities are just trying to hurt everything in the arena. They don't take sides. It is the equivalent of when of when they throw lions into gladiatorial arenas. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Or think of the uh, Sarlacc pit from uh, Return of the Jedi. Yep. Um. And speaking of that, I do I do see how that you have schem you have um, schematics with their own events for for um, Legacy Edition. Yep. Um, and I did have to laugh at the example given called the Glory Hole. <laughs> it's actually called the Gory Hole. <laughs> yeah, I yeah I missed small smaller text, so I missed I missed the L part. And if yeah. somebody thinks that's crass. I remind you that Banjo Kazooie had on, had on the menu on the menu at that one spot early on, um, Toad in the Hole. <laughs> yes, it is. It is a very obvious reference. Um, when when you do uh, get the book, you'll be able to read all the text and the backstory behind the gory hole, and uh, why it is set up the way it is. It's mm -hmm. it's actually. Uh, the official name of the barge is called the Dungeon Voyeur, um, also known as the Gory Hole. 
The official name isn't much better. <laughs> so, yeah, with the schematics, again, this, this goes all the way back to the early days and, and how it was originally designed. Um, we've had these barges, these unsanctioned barges, for uh, since the beginning of the game. And um, these schematics and the way the arenas would be set up are are all part of that and each each arena feeling different um from the from the other one that you've played to the point where you even call the turning point deck a little bit um the original version of the game the there were certain cards that were only available in certain arenas but again when we came to the to the big box you know, version. We were like, we, we need to simplify this. We don't, we don't need to get too deep in the weeds. Like, people need to be able to just take it out of the box, sit down, figure out how to play it, play it, and enjoy, you know, enjoy the game. Hmm. Uh, with the book, though, it's kind of understood that hey, I want to put a little bit more, um, I want to put a little bit more thought into this. I want to take a little bit more time with it. I want to kind of immer- immerse myself in the lore and have that. You know that subtle little RPG feel, without the need of having a you know a GM or uh, a whole campaign uh, set out. You know, but still have that Barney-like imagination time. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking speaking of which, let's talk about the pit boss since we're going to be talking <laughs> since you just talked about GMs. Yeah, yeah, I knew I was I, I knew I was leading myself right into that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the pit boss. I'm I'm really excited about the pit boss. Um, again, this goes back to this is this is kind of a sandbox arena combat system. W- one of the biggest reasons, and you know, it's it's not super important, right? It's just a name, but it's one of the reasons that we changed it from Nexus the board game to Nexus the arena combat system, because that's that's essentially what we've done is we've we've built this system. For arena combat, for you commanding these helots to kill each other, it's something we always intend on expanding on uh, new classes, new skills, new maneuvers, new moves, um, even uh, new elevations to to where you have advantages if you're standing on top of crates and different things like that. There's lots of room in this system to play around and build upon it. So in this Legacy Edition, we we kind of give it a name and we call it the Pit Boss. And this is a neutral party who's going to do all of these things for your group, right? Um, they're gonna they're gonna come up with their own barges. They're gonna come up with their own turning point cards. They're gonna come up with weapons. They're they're gonna come up with um, pre and post fight events mm-hmm. right now this section of the book is sitting right at about I think 30 pages um, of different ideas and inspirations and ways to just get the most out of this big box of fun that you that you purchased yeah now Given that one of the other things that's noted is rule is having all the rules in one place, along with clarifications, mm-hmm. were there en- were there any in the in the time that you've done te- testing and gotten feedback and all that? Were there were there any cases of a particular rule or a particular combination that seemed all right at the time, but once pr- once um practice actually got into things, it what that was not the case. So, so here's the, here's the here's the fun part is, you know, we've play tested this obviously quite a bit over the last um, six years before the 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 rules were kind of finalized for that for that big box, but because of the sandbox nature of it, things things interact in ways that you, you just can't possibly be prepared for all of them until you have hundreds and hundreds of people playing multiple matches, you know, of the game, right? So what, one of the things that um, it inspired me to do was to build a, a knowledge base for the game. And that's kind of how I track 
these clarifications and what needs further clarification. So if you're familiar at all with software development, you know what a knowledge base is. Mm -hmm. And what I did is I, I made a knowledge base. I put everything from the rule book in there. I put everything from all of the videos that I shot from the QR codes um, in the same sections of the knowledge base. And as people um, asked questions or needed further clarifications of rules, I added those to the to the knowledge base. So as you're going through the rule book, you'll notice there's a lot of important notes. When I designed the rule book, it was, hey, here's all the rules that are very straightforward. And all the important notes were, you know, things that you weren't quite sure how to how to interpret. They needed just a little bit more explanation. So in the knowledge base, I have those important notes, but then I do important notes in red, anything that has been added after the the rule manual. And I think I'm up to maybe maybe six of those um, since since the game's been released, where it really needed like a like a clear explanation of a of a rule. Um, of a weird situation. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, oh, and I do appreciate the knowledge base thing, as well as you bringing up so, um, software engineering, because I every time I hear that, I immediately get flashbacks to the programmer's drinking song. <laughs> no, ninety nine little bugs in the code, ninety nine bugs in the code. You take one down, you patch it around, two hundred eighty seven bugs in the code. <laughs> I've used that joke quite a bit, but it, I'll stop using the joke when it keep, when it stops applying. So, <laughs> unfortunately, that means I'm going to be using that joke for quite a while. Be because, well, you've done, you've done, you've you've messed around with lines of code. You know the you know the po the horrors. Oh yeah. Oh. Um, now. Whenever I get whenever I get a board game or, or a miniatures game or just just about any game I can get away with it really, um, I inevitably I end up house ruling. Right. Has has anybody As you should. Has, has anybody messed around with do with doing house rules for the for their game that that they've sh that they've shared or have you messed yeah. around with house rules just to get away with it? Absolutely. Um, so one of the house rules um, that gets around is some people don't like how slow traits build up. So some people have found creative ways to have the helots increase their traits faster throughout the course of a bout. Hmm. Um, I, I think one is whenever you roll a one or a six on your um, uh, initiative roll, you double your traits for that, for that round. Uh, different things like that. A house rule that I do, um, just to keep myself sane, Whenever you uh, have a turning point roll duplicate, you're supposed to roll where each of the fires move, right? So any fires that have been knocked off a brazier that are on the floor when there's a turning point roll duplicate, you roll to see, you roll the directional die to see where, um, where those fires move to individually. I don't, I'm too lazy to do that. I roll the directional die and all the fires just move in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, and, and again, I, I encourage for people to house rule the game. The The most important rule in Nexus is to have fun playing Nexus. And if there is anything in that game that is making it not fun for you, remove it or figure out a way to make it fun. Rule um, zero. Yeah, that's, I mean, it is, it is the most important thing. You are buying a box of stuff for your entertainment. Um, this game is made ideally to be played with friends while shit talking and drinking and you know people miss stuff all the time they forget to mark their turning point counter or whatever you you laugh you move on you, you just enjoy the game if, if everybody's having a good time you're playing the game right if um, not you're doing something wrong um one of the things i usually do with games is whoever gets last place or or, or something close um, they have to. They have to drink the pain glass. <laughs> did I tell you about the pain glass the last time I had you on? No, I, I. If you did, I've forgotten. I can imagine. I can imagine what the pain glass well, is. You've got two options. Option A, you drink a bottle of bacon soda. 
Hmm. That's B. That is B A C O N. I'm not having somebody drink baking soda. I'm. Why yeah. Would... I got gotcha. you. I'm with you. It it. Imagine mixing bacon grease and club soda. That's what it tastes like. It is as rancid as you think it is. Well, some people tell me that that sounds that that sounds enjoyable. For those for those people, I usually I usually keep um, one of the bottles of Pepsi with with cinnamon, just to give just to give something that they're not going to going to enjoy. Uh huh. Because Pepsi with cinnamon is the equivalent of a fireball without the alcohol. Oh, the other option is a shot glass filled with water, salt, sea salt, pepper, black pepper, three um, Tabasco sauce, Frank's Red Hot sauce, Tiger sauce, sriracha, and ground up jalapeno seeds. You should do a third option for Malort. What is Malort? You don't know about Malort? If I do, if I do, I only know it in name. So it's a, um, it's an alcohol. It's a. I don't know what it's supposed to be, but it's a liquor, and it, it's been described as licking a dumpster. The, I I don't know the true story behind it, but I have, um, I've heard that it was. It was created by somebody who was a chain smoker and, and wanted something that tasted like cigarettes. <laughs> it's really horrible. It's it's big in the in the Chicago area. I think that's its its birthplace. But I wouldn't um, be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if it's from the Chicago area. I wouldn't be surprised if whoever made it was a was a White Sox fan. <laughs> you know, just finding finding ways to drown out the pain of being a White Sox fan. I, so the uh, I, I had never heard of it. I was introduced to it at a uh, gamma gamma trade show in Reno, which is like the big board game um, convention uh, out there for distributors and retailers and stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, a, a retailer from Chicago was carrying it around in her backpack and uh, introduced me. To Malort, and it was it was horrible. As bad as bad as she said it was going to be, it she it lived up and beyond the the words. So I would add I would add that to your repertoire of pain. If I can find the recipe, I will consider it. It's not a recipe. You just buy the bottle. They sell this. <laughs> they sell this to people. <laughs> you just you just buy a bottle of Malort. Uh, and just drink it. There's no preparation needed. <laughs> now the thing is, I got I got to have somebody actually finish the th- the thing. So I will see. I will see. <laughs> but um, I'd probably only have to use that once, and then no, and then nobody would even think about cheating ever again. <laughs> you know the the old the old saying: one sword keeps another in the sheath. Mm-hmm. Um. Something that something that I found a bit interesting on the GameFound page because this isn't because this isn't something that is br- is brought up was the blurb that you put in the in um, media about yeah. not paying for reviews playthroughs or anything like that was yeah were there instances in the in the past where somebody appro- somebody approached you ab- about doing it much much in the way I approached but actually um. Actually, st- actually, was asking for payment. Oh yeah, almost, almost exclusively. Um, yeah, there, there would, there would be people that would come up and you know, hey, I'm really interested in your game. This is really cool. Blah blah blah. Give me money. Um, and pretty much, you know, coming into this, I wasn't a, I wasn't a board game. Um, developer. I didn't know how things went. I assumed that the majority of people that were doing YouTube videos and reviews were people that were um, very interested in like board games as far as what they wanted to present and things that, that caught their eye that they wanted to share with people. Mm-hmm. 
and as it turns out a lot of a lot of these reviewers are making a living like this is their this is their income this is their job this is their 9 to 5 and how they sustain that is by people you know publishers paying them to talk about their game review their game do a playthrough you know whatever um and for our first few kickstarters even even in the last kickstarter um i i definitely played that game where it was like hey here's you know here's some money um i realize that this is your job you know please sit down put together a video for for my game and i i want to use this to promote it and i tried very hard over the years just to get a a playthrough of the game where like major rules were not misinterpreted you know um, like core core concepts gotten right and what, it, what I found is not everybody has time to do that hmm. so if you've got a cookie cutter game where you can say yeah this plays like that this is this mechanics from this game this is from that game um, they can they can do a very good job and, and roll through it. But with something like Nexus, where it doesn't fit very neatly in the board game world, there are some kind of RPG aspects, different you know, different mechanics that aren't used uh, commonly, um, then it takes a little bit more time and attention, and that doesn't always, that, uh, that care doesn't always get taken with the game. Um, so you end up paying, in some cases, thousands of dollars for content that you don't really want to use because <laughs> they're not even, you know, showing how to play your game correctly. But, you know, you've spent all this money and you need that, you need that bump, you need that attention. So you're, you're in a situation where you got to release it anyway. Um, and then you just, you find that it doesn't do what you what you think it's going to do, um, at least for us anyway. Where when people are are watching somebody re review games with meeples all the times, and um, then you have something like Nexus, it's a very small segment of that audience that that gets it. Hmm. It's a small segment overall of, of people that get Nexus. Yeah, um, I I don't know if you're are you familiar with uh, Doug Stanhope at all. I am. Okay. So he's a very a very crass uh, comedian. Mm -hmm. And you know, he has a he has a quote where he says, Hey, look, I don't have a huge fan base, but they'll drive a long way to come see me. Um that's that's kinda how Nexus is. We are not the most easily marketed game out there, but for the people that get it, um, there's nothing there's nothing else that scratches that edge. And Truth, truth be told, when it, I'm, and you, you probably, you probably figured this out very quick, very quickly the first time I had you on. Um, I don't play, I don't play the usual game. <laughs> mm -hmm. Whether, whether it be, whether it be the influencer game, I, I can't, I can't help but internally vomit every time, every time someone even thinks of associating me with influencers, <laughs> or, or how I, um, or how I handle. Um, reviewing stuff. Usually, it's just what I did with you. I just email somebody saying, "This is who I am. This is what I do. I'd like to talk to you about it, about about your about your stuff, and and see where it goes from there." Um, usually, I don't even I don't even ask for for like a, for like a review copy or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll ask for like a, I'll ask for like a quick start or a, or a, or some bits of a draft, so I have something to f I have something to work with so I'm not flying blind but that's yeah. as far as it goes yeah yeah as a matter of fact even after um, our, our last interview I, I reached out to you once I mean years later <laughs> once the game was finally made yeah it was like, hey buddy can I send you a copy of this because I really appreciated you taking the time to do the interview yeah um, so yeah no that's it it's refreshing well you know I I have spent years um, burying journalists who who take who take doggy bags, as it were, mm -hmm. 
and or the or the or or the access shit and I never wanted to fall into that trap. Yeah. But there is, you know, and and I'm not I'm not trying to say that that it's all bad out there um, by any means. And again, I really do understand that, you know, if if this is going to be your nine to five, mm-hmm. is you know doing board game reviews, it's not like it's this massive market. Like I understand, there's there's a limited amount of options for for someone to be able to support themselves and their families doing this. I don't begrudge anybody doing it. I totally understand it. I'm just, I haven't noticed it really doing anything for me. I seem to get more out of the sincere um, attempts than I do from the others. Mm-hmm. Um, King of Average has has talked about us uh, quite a few times because it's just, there's something about the project that kind of spoke to him. I know he really likes our slogan, the motivated by violence, fueled by dice thing. Mm-hmm. is uh, that, that gets him right in the feels. Um, we have a we have a super fan in uh, Germany, uh, Marcel, who mm-hmm. does tons of content for us in German. I usually have to wait for a couple hours after he posts his videos, so I can uh, so YouTube can translate the captions to English before I can before I can actually watch the content and see and see what he's saying. Um, but that type of stuff is is amazing. Like that's that's the really really good stuff and that's the stuff that means the most to me and for the people that are actually fans of the project and um are are into it and they're not just um writing like fomo not that we have a bunch of fomo to us but um i think they enjoy these types of interviews and this type of coverage more because it's it's people really paying attention not people trying to get through this so they can so they can get to their next paying gig Mm mm-hmm and while I, I'm not getting, I'm not getting paid, I'm not getting paid for any of, any of this. No, nope. everybody, I've made it very clear that I, ha, I have a outlaw method of how I, of how I operate because, well, this is the open bar of the internet. <laughs> I'm a monk, not a, mer, not a, not a, um, mercenary. Yeah, a monk, not a merc. I like that. Mm-hmm. That's snappier. But. See, I gave you one line back, so now I will owe you one. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I feel maybe you've already put it in the put it in there, but I feel like now with the introduction of the D Mart as far as part of the Legacy Edition book, mm-hmm. I feel like that's a perfect opportunity for an Evil Dead joke. It's just I need to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> So it's funny that you bring that up, and this is for for anybody listening this long. Um, this will be a neat little Easter egg. But um, one of the things that I've been working on. So everyone wants a solo mode for Nexus. I, I get. I I could sell so many more copies of this game if I would just put together a bullshit solo mode for it, right? Mm-hmm. Where I just, you know, yeah, yeah, here's the solo mode. Right. You know, knock yourself out, guys. Um, but I really want I really want there to be a fun solo mode for, mode for the game. I know it's possible. It's not number one on my list of things that, that I'm working on for it. And I've tried to shop it off to other people who give up. Um, maybe because I'm too critical. But regardless of the reason, there's no solo mode for Nexus. So what this has done is this has made me really want to put together a solo mode game, a game that's made purely for a solo mode, instead of a, a game and then and then trying to work it into a solo mode, actually making it a solo mode game from scratch. And my son and I have actually been working on a solo mode or a solo game um, based on based on Evil Dead and and the cabin and all the areas within and outside of the cabin. And uh, so, yeah, the that's out there now in the yeah. universe for anybody that cares. So what would you be shooting for as far as the release window for Legacy Edition? So when the campaign ends at the end of August, August 25th will be the last day of the campaign, I'm going to send PDFs out to all of the backers with where things are at right now. 
Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to be listening to feedback um, about anything people want to give me feedback on, right? Um, I'll be collecting that feedback for about a month and then I will do the final edits um, based on that feedback, put a pretty bow on everything, make changes and get it all out to print. And my hope is that by December, the actual printing process will have begun at our manufacturer. Um, And if that happens, it's just the book and then whatever add-ons. So the campaign's doing, it, it, it got off to a much faster start than I thought it was going to. Um, I really wasn't sure what to expect because this is not common for somebody to release a board game and be like, hey, and here's a book as an expansion. So I wasn't really sure how the, how the community was going to react to it. But they've reacted really well and I'm really excited about it. So um, I'll probably add a couple stretch goals. One of the biggest things about the stretch goals is I'm not going to do anything that's going to hold up production of what people are really wanting, which is the book, right? Mm-hmm. So anything that's going to take longer to get done than the book is not going to be put up there as a stretch goal. But um, one of the things that I'm looking at is a, a about journal where basically people can, you know, just a, a simple book for people to record, you know, their bout experiences and, you know, the, the stories and, and, you know, the creds one and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, people were suggesting earlier today uh, pads, like just old school uh, character pads, like a sheet of, you know, character sheets that for Lannistas and, and Helots and stuff um, that would be included. One of the things that I want to do is similar, basically a GM screen for a lot of the tables and and different things that are going to be within the book. Um, Much like the action menus that you have in the box game, I'd like to have this kind of GM screen as kind of a quick reference for people while they're playing so they don't have to constantly be diving back into the book to, to look things up. And um, that type of screen you could also use, you know, if you have a pit boss so they can hide all of their, their devious plans from the uh, from the rest of the table. Mm-hmm. And but yeah. Oh, go ahead. Um, so December, December things should start printing. Um, it won't take much longer than a month for production. And then it's just the process of getting it from the manufacturer to all the different places that it needs to be. Uh, there's one wrinkle in this that I didn't have to deal with last time. So last time I just had the stuff from the manufacturer and then that was being sent to where it needed to be and then off to you know different players around the globe. This time I'm going to have stuff from the manufacturer, but then I'm also going to have stuff that's here in the States um, because like the plastic game board and some of the other components that I'm offering in this are just made, are made here um, locally by myself. So I'll need to send those overseas and, and try and time that with the stuff from the manufacturers to get distribution to, to send it where it needs to go. Um, it's not super complicated, especially compared to most other Kickstarter projects. I, I know enough to limit the amount of SKUs on the project so I don't have distributors pulling their hair out, sending wrong components to people. And you know, a lot of people will, will blame distributors for um, not paying attention to you know to their orders but a lot of times you really need to you need to blame the publisher and the people that did their kickstarter where they have like 170 versions of the same project that that a distributor needs to pay attention to as they're trying to ship that thing out Mm -hmm. um sometimes it's you're you're just asking too much you're just asking for problems when you do things like that so try not to do that whenever Whenever it comes to distributors and things going wrong, the my first instinct is always to come back to the Heroes World incident with Marvel in the '90s, uh-huh. where Marvel Marvel had decided Marvel had um, decided to because they didn't want to jump on the diamond bandwagon to to um, get their own distributor, that being Heroes World. Now, up until right. the, up until they did that, Heroes World had only handled the tri-state area of the U.S., and mm-hmm. they did it very well. 
But it's one thing to handle the tri-state area. It's another thing to handle the entire continental U.S. But Marvel was like, "Hey, well, it's cool. We'll 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 send you a brand new phone system." <laughs> Here's the problem. The place where this new phone system was set up was in a room with no ventilation. <laughs> and everything went wrong, so angry callers were coming in full force. Keep in mind, this was the 90s. Yeah. So the 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 frequency of the calls and and um, well, you've been you've been around electronics. You know how hot things can get. Yeah. Um, you've. You've had to deal. You probably had to deal with those loud, loud fans in server rooms. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they didn't have anything like that, so the phone system got wrecked, got literally destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, when it comes to the whole, is is the publisher or the distributor at fault? I take the approach of there's shit in everybody's yard. Yeah. Sometimes there's more shit than others. I don't know. Maybe they've got a dog that ha- that that ate something they shouldn't that week. <laughs> there's a, there's a lovely mental image. <laughs> <laughs> but with that said, I I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way back to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Again, thank you, thank you so much for for having me. It's I, I really enjoy um, getting a chance to talk about this. Uh, I, I very much enjoyed uh, the last interview that we did, and 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 this one as well. So I'm I am more than happy to uh, to come back anytime anytime you like. Mm-hmm. And of co- of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!